And all right, hi everybody, and welcome to our EdTech Teacher webinar tonight. I'm Beth Holland from EdTech Teacher, and super glad to see all of you here. It looks like we've got um, wow, 40 people in the chat box right now. So please take a moment as we're getting started and introduce yourself in the chat box. So I'm thrilled to be joined here tonight with colleagues Greg Kulik and Sean McCusker. And as you know, we're talking Google Classroom. So I will let Sean and Greg introduce themselves and then we will get going. So Greg, if you want to go and then we'll go from here. Sure. Hello, everyone. Greg Kulik, um, former history teacher and an instructor with EdTech Teacher. And I'll be doing um, a lot of the instruction tonight around Google Classroom. <clears throat> Hi everybody, I'm Sean McCusker. I'm a social studies teacher in Libertyville, Illinois. Um, I also run one to one tech chat where we do a lot of conversations about um, exactly topics like this, talk about how to integrate technology into our classrooms. Um, I'm interested in learning more about Google Classroom and, and finding out ways to make it do more for me. Great, so I'm just going to get our slides pulled up and we are going to get things started. So there's all our contact information. If you want to reach out to us afterwards on Twitter, um, we'd be happy to follow up and answer any questions you might have. And then also um, in that embedded chat box below the streaming video right now, Beth and Sean will both be taking questions there. And then if there's any really pressing questions, we can always kind of answer them live right through the webinar as well. So let's just do kind of a brief overview, really brief overview, like what is Classroom? So this is Google's um, workflow solution, trying to make your life a bit easier and take away some of all of the, what can potentially be some really messy kind of manual organization in Google Drive. If you've been using Google Drive at all, and Sean's going to talk a bit more about this later, you've probably gone through some of the pitfalls or frustrations with um, how Google Drive can kind of get in the way in the classroom if you're not really comfortable with it and your students don't have some background experience. So Google Classroom will ideally simplify the process for us and make the technology kind of be secondary to whatever our goals are, whether that's student writing or collaboration or presentations that they'll be working on all through kind of the Google Drive interface. Um, so if you're going to think about going down this path, uh, why would you even select using this tool? A big overview of what it will do for you. It'll automate the process of workflow in your classroom. And what we mean by that is um, distributing documents, collecting documents, organizing documents for you. One other really nice feature is that classroom will create uh, a unit of uh, a virtual classroom environment for the students and the teachers. So a teacher can go to Google Classroom and see all their classroom, all of their classes, right on one kind of big panel. Um, if a student goes to Google Classroom and they have multiple teachers using that tool, they'll be able to be able to see all of their classrooms all from one login in one place. Um, it's a cross-platform tool because it's totally web-based, so you can use this um, on a any tablet that can get to the web. You can use it on a laptop, on a desktop. There's no kind of um, proprietary um, tools in place with this uh, platform. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Classroom will simplify all of the things you might need to do with Google Drive in terms of distributing work and collecting work. Um, students will no longer have to worry about naming documents accurately. You won't have to worry about making copies of documents or shedding, setting uh, permission settings or having shared folders or shared resources. All of that will be taken care of through this platform. The one feature that I think is possibly the most helpful is the fact that you can set due dates for assignments in Google Classroom, and there is actually a formalized turn-in process. So if you've been using Google Drive with your students at all, um, there really is no way, unless you use additional tools, something like Doctopus, there is no way to really set. Um, I know when I was using Drive years ago with my students, um, while a paper might be due Friday afternoon at 2.05, there's really nothing to stop the students from working on it uh, Friday evening to stop the process. And with Classroom, one other feature also, and this really may have to do with um, using something like an iPad or an Android classroom, is that you can have students turn in non-Google stuff or they can work beyond Google. So being able to submit video or screencasts or annotated PDF documents or links to post or a website, that content can be turned in. It doesn't just have to be Google products. So what I mentioned, 
mention why we might want to go down this route is all the kind of manual workflow you may have to deal with when you're working in um, using Google Drive without Google Classroom. So I'm actually going to let Sean take over here to talk a bit about what it's like using Google and, and Google Drive in your classroom without Google Classroom in place. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> so if you've if you ever used a Google Drive for your classroom before, and if you use it regularly, you'll start to notice that it gets really, it doesn't take very long before you start to accumulate a lot of different files. And there's a few ways that in the past we tried to manage that and to make workflow within Google Drive efficient and effective. The first of those is the naming convention. Because if you ever have to go looking for something in Google Drive, you absolutely have to be able to find what it is exactly that you're looking for. And if you don't if you don't have a standardized naming convention, it's very easy for a student to have turned in the work, done exactly what they were supposed to do, but then when it came time for grades to go in the grade book, that assignment's missing, and they were really frustrated. So um, using relatively strict naming conventions, for instance, with mine, it was always the period number, the assignment, and then their last name, I could search and always know what I was looking for. At that point, once students had created a document and named it appropriately, they then had to share it with you, which meant that they would um, select you, share the document over to you, and then it would appear within your drive. Um, then at the teacher had to take those and organize them somehow. So it looks a little bit like this. Individual students go out and create individual documents. They share them to the teacher using the naming convention. The teacher searches using that naming convention and then selects and drags all of those similarly named documents into the folder. Um, that group folder was a way for the teacher to organize all that work into one assignment folder so that they could keep it in one place. If a student turned in work late, though, it's difficult because you wouldn't really know that that work had been turned in late. You have to go looking for it. So you had the delay of, of any work that was late or a student who was absent that you were going to have to come back and revisit this process, which got really, really time-consuming. Although it was effective, it was enormous. It, would, it could be cumbersome over time. Right? The other option that prevented you from having to do that again, and which is, you know, if they're naming the document every single time, one typo, one mistake, or one space where it wasn't supposed to be could throw off your ability to find it. So the next option, if you can go to the next slide, was to do folders. And only one time you would have the students create a folder and share that folder to you as a teacher. That made sure that no matter what, if a student put whatever work that they did into that folder, you would always have it and you never had to look for it. The problem became if you had an assignment and you had that assignment, if you're a high school teacher, you have 150 students, you were going to have to do a, a lot of extra clicking. You're going to have to click into the folder for each individual student. You're going to then have to find the document that they turned into. You have to click on that. Then you grade it. And then you're going to have to click out of all of those things and reverse that process. And while it may not seem like a lot, if you're adding five extra clicks for every assignment that you grade and there's 150 extra clicks, 750 clicks later, you'll be aware of how much of it could be a problem. So while the, the process was effective, it, it prevented pe things from getting lost as easily, it was also a little bit labor intensive as you tried to look into every single class. And then once you were done grading or you had to do the grading process again, or if a student turned revisions in. You had to do a lot of digging to get towards all of those revisions. So that also was an effective solution that really worked for class, but again, cumbersome and time consuming. Go to the next one. All right, so then the other option that you could find to distribute materials to the students was that you could create one shared folder. The teacher would create the folder. The teacher would then share that folder with every single person in their class. Extremely effective, extremely quick. The problem was that anything that was in that folder that the students had that they wanted to use, they would have to copy that material into their folder, rename it with the naming convention that you had, which kind of reverses the order of where the issue comes from. but. Um, you still have students who have to take the task of doing the naming convention, have to pay attention to detail, and make sure that they're following the instructions or things will get lost. They could end up in the abyss. So um, it, it was just one more step that made it harder for people to effectively collect, to distribute materials. Great. Thanks, Sean. Um, I think that gave us a really solid overview of maybe some of the pitfalls that you'd face or the frustrations that you run into. And if anyone's been using Google Drive with students, you've probably come across all that stuff. So now let's dig into the purpose of the webinar. Let's look at Google Classroom and what it can afford and also recognize some of the limitations of the tool towards the end of the webinar. 
So the platform we want to go to is classroom.google.com. Um, you can do this live if you want to right now. Um, one thing I would absolutely point out, and I've dealt with this with a number of workshops, I've been doing lately and working with teachers to explore this tool. Um, it's domain specific, so if you log in with your school's Google Apps domain, only other p teachers or students from that domain can log into your class. If you're going there as a teacher for the first time, it will ask you, are you a student or a teacher? Even if you're going to join another teacher's class or you're going to join a professional development class or a little demo class, make sure as a teacher that you identify that you are a teacher or else your Google Apps admin will have to log in and change the status of your account and you will not be able to make classes. One pitfall at this point, um, unless there's some work done behind the scenes by your Google Apps admin, um, even if students go to Google Classroom for the first time, they may in many cases be able to say that they are a teacher, which won't really wreak any havoc outside of they'll be able to create their own classes. Um, so just recognize that as kind of where we stand right now with Classroom. There is a help page um, that you can get to in the Google Apps admin panel to change the status of any account that's been identified the wrong way upon that initial sign-in. So let's do a, a relatively brief overview of, of what this tool offers us. So the first thing, because we're talking all Google products, there's direct syncing between Google Classroom and Google Drive. So the little screenshot here, I have two classes that I'm running in Google Classroom, and then in the bottom right-hand corner, if you see my Google Drive account, what will happen automatically as soon as you log into Google Classroom, a folder called Classroom will be created in your Google Drive account. Any class you then create within Google Classroom will have its own subfolder, and then it just goes deeper from there. If you create assignments within, within any particular class, a subfolder will be created for that, for that particular class um, to collect the work. One thing you may want to do, which is possible, it won't ruin your Google Classroom setup, you may want to rename this folder if you want to instead of Classroom. You can call it something else. You might want to add the year onto there. Um, if you're doing sharing between multiple accounts, that might make it easier to deal with. Um, so renaming folders is okay. If you misname something originally, you can rename it later. And I'll talk more about naming strategies within Google Classroom as we progress through the webinar. Um, there's a, it's a very simplified interface. I think in many ways that's good because you can get started right away. I know the first time I was exposed to Classroom, I saw it for all of you know five or ten minutes during a lunch break and then used it in a workshop right after the lunch break. So it doesn't take long to figure out how to use the tool. There are some tips about being thoughtful with it to make sure it works the right way. So within Classroom, you can post announcements as a teacher or you can post assignments. With both tools, it, whether you post an announcement or an assignment, you have the ability to upload files, pull files from your Google Drive account, add a YouTube video, or add a link. Also, if you'll notice off to the right, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, you have the ability to kind of uh, push these either uh, announcements or assignments out to multiple classes. So you don't have to duplicate your work if you're looking to push one assignment out to all five of your classes if it's the same class or same section in this little screenshot here. So if I was posting an announcement to my EdTech teacher class, I can post it to that one or just check off my T21 class and post it to that section as well. So what are the different assignment types that you can use within Google Classroom? I've tried to break this down into student generated, teacher generated, and then non-Google. So anything that's Google related, well, if I'm calling it a Google product, meaning um, a Google document, a Google slide, or a Google sheet, that can be turned in by a student. So when I say student generated, what I mean by that is the teacher can generate the assignment and just put a very simple assignment of, you know, create a Google document, um, here's your prompt, create a document and turn it in on your own, or make sure you turn your slides in by Friday as Google Slides, or make sure you turn your spreadsheet in by Friday as a Google Sheet. So student generated, and you'll see what I mean by this a little bit later. On the other hand, you can have teacher generated Google products, meaning as a teacher, I can go in and create a Google document that is essentially a template that my students will create, will um, complete and then turn in. The nice thing about that is Google Classroom will do all the automation and almost all that secretary work in the background for you, making duplicate copies of that template for each one of your students. So that's the teacher-generated side of it, which is really nice because the teacher can do all the formatting, put uh, requirements, um, hints to your students, resources, links, anything you want to put in the assignment, you can put it in there ahead of time and then duplicate it for each student. On the other hand, 
Um, any students that are, um, you know, creating any sort of multimedia, whether that's video or screencasts or they're writing online on a blog or they're annotating a PDF document or they're making an image, if you can get the content into your Google Drive account, a student can turn that content in. So it's a non-Google product, but they're going to get it into Google Drive um, to turn that into Google Classroom. So, and I mentioned this um, in this previous slide, in terms of distribution options, these three options are, are um, very helpful. I would say the last one is by far the most helpful when it comes to managing the workflow. Because Google Classroom has this built-in function to make a copy for each student, this really comes into play when we're talking about Google products created by the teacher. So the teacher now could create a template within Google Slides, push that out to the class as an assignment, make an individual copy for each student, and it will be named exactly how it should be named. It will be pushed out to the students and collected into the folder um, for that particular assignment. That same can be done with a Google document or a Google spreadsheet. If you look at the option above that, students can edit the file. This is fantastic when you want um, the entire class collaborating on one document, or you want the entire class collaborating on one set of Google slides where each student may have one or two slides they're responsible for. That's what that option can be used for, big class work. Um, students can view the file, that's obvious, that would be pushing out a read-only file of some sort, whether it's a Google document or any other file type. And the, the overview, what I really like to spend the rest of the webinar on is doing Google Classroom so you can see how it works. So I will be running um, a demo classroom as the teacher and I'll be playing the student and then Sean and Beth are also students in my class and we're going to work our way through all the different types of scenarios in terms of pushing assignments out, collecting assignments, and I want you to see kind of step by step what's going to happen with all the different scenarios you might encounter. So give me one second here, I'm just going to swap my screens so you can see a different view. All right, so what you guys should see now, and Beth and Sean, if you can give me a confirmation, what you should see is my home screen in Google Classroom. Sean and Beth, could either one of you guys give me a confirmation there? Yes, okay, perfect. So when I mentioned earlier about this unified interface, um, kind of meaning that I'm logged into Classroom right now as a teacher, and every class that I'm running would pop up on the screen and so I can jump into my T21 class or jump into the classroom for this webinar. The same view goes for the student. When they log into Google Classroom, they can see every class all in one kind of streamlined view. I'm also a quick account. If you'll notice here, like I mentioned earlier, as soon as I logged into Google Classroom, a folder was generated in my Google Drive account called Classroom. In that folder is a subfolder for each class that I'm teaching. So that will help it happen automatically. You don't need to do any work on that side of it. So let's get into Google Classroom. And I will post my first, first announcement to the group. If I wanted to at this point, I could give them a file, anything that's in my Google Drive account, a video to watch, or a link to any sort of resource. So I can say, please uh, review this before class I'm going to grab a URL go back to Google classroom I'll paste the link there add that in and now I can post this to the class I could also cross post this like I mentioned earlier to any other class that I'm teaching and if this is an announcement there's no due date associated with it students will something that they need to complete. I'm just going to post that to the class. Now for the students that are in my class right now, they'll see that announcement post momentarily, and then what they're going to be able to do is actually reply to that. So if you'll notice below the announcement, there's Sean and Beth, and once my student um, classroom loads as well, we can have not a threaded discussion. I, I take that back. We can have a kind of one level deep discussion so in, in this way, you can kind of use Google Classroom as a discussion forum. Sean and Beth, if you could post something as well, um, just to kind of sh show what happens. And there we have one student already posted. I got the link. This is a great resource. So you could push out an article 
helpful for students to read and ask them to write a comment below. You could push out um, a PDF document that students can read and ask them to write a reply to a, you know, a thoughtful discussion question below. So that's one way that you can, you can use Google Classroom, really just as a discussion forum. So what we're going to do now is move on to probably the more powerful side of this, which is the assignment side. So instead of announcement, I tap on assignment. So what I'll click, I'll do now is do um, 001. 001 Google Classroom is the name of the assignment. What I could call this as well, maybe I'll make this a little bit easier. I'll call this US History 1. So this is something to consider when you're using Google Classroom, is how you're naming your assignments. And I actually got this tip from Alice Keeler by reading through a few of her recent blog posts about Google Classroom. So a tip of the hat to Alice for this thoughtful approach. Um, going 001 as the assignment name, what that's going to do in my Google Drive account is when the assignments start piling in in folders, this will automatically put them in chronological order for me, 001, 002, 003. If I took the approach of just kind of haphazardly or randomly naming my assignments, um, when they go into Google Drive, they won't have any particular order to them. The only way I can see this causing some sort of problem is if you're going to cross post to multiple classes um, and you're going by one kind of linear naming convention of 01, 02, 03, if you don't post something to one class and you skip an assignment but then you follow up with the same naming convention, it could throw things off. But again, keep in mind, in Google Drive, you can always rename full. We're doing our first assignment just to this one class, um, history assignment one. Now, what I, what I mentioned earlier is the ability when you're using Google Classroom is to use teacher created documents, and that's what we're gonna do here. So I'm gonna jump over to Google, Classroom, uh, Google Drive, go into my Classroom folder, go into this webinar folder, and if you'll notice, actually let me clean this up for a second. If, if you'll notice, when you make your first assignment, it makes a folder called Templates Do Not Edit, so that will that the teacher generates and pushes out to their students through Classroom. Now, in reality, if I'm generating the template as a teacher, I can put it anywhere I want in Google Drive. I don't have to put it in this class folder. I can make a separate folder on my own. So you can really put that teacher. So what I'm going to do is just put it in this folder, a Google document right now, and this is going to be assignment one. There's my assignment that I just created, 001 US History. I'm going to close that document out, go back to Google Classroom. When it's time for me to generate the assignment, I'm going to click on the Google Drive icon and pull that assignment directly from my Google Drive account. So I know I put it in Classroom. I know I put it in, and we're digging into Google Drive right now, and that's the assignment I'd like to push out. I'm going to add that in. So over here now is my preferences to decide how do I want my students to have access to this. So I'm going to say make a copy for each student and assign them this work. So as the, as the Google Classroom is pushing this assignment out, I get an instant notification um, that three assignments are uh, pushed out and zero students have finished that assignment. So right now, Sean and Beth have this assignment um, pushed out to them. So what I'm going to do now is give you a view of my student perspective. So you can see what the completion process is going to look like, and I'm also going to have Beth and Sean complete this assignment as well. So give me one second here. I'm going to jump to my student perspective. So what you're actually seeing in iPad is playing a role in this class. So I'll back out to the course again. So you notice the student immediately gets a notification that they have an upcoming assignment that's due to assignment. And I can see right away, if you'll notice here, the name of the assignment and it's automatically named account for that particular student. So it does that naming convention for convention for you automatically. So I'm going to tap on that file, and if you'll notice on an iPad, it's really nice because it bumps you directly to the Google Docs app where the student can start writing. 
So the date is 923. The period is, let's say this is fourth period that I'm in. And I will say, I have no idea. There, I'm done with my work. I'm going to back out. Now, one thing that students may consider the first time they're doing this is that they'll think, okay, I went to classroom, I clicked on the document, I completed the assignment, but that does not mean that it's turned in. To actually turn an assignment in, you have to go to Google Classroom and turn the work in. So while this assignment has been completed by the student, it's almost like it's floating in their backpack, which is their Google Drive account that's not actually turned in yet. Before I turn it in, what I'm actually going to do is jump back over to my teacher view in Google Classroom. And what I want you to see is what I'll see as the teacher from this perspective even before the assignments are turned in. So if I click on the actual assignment as a teacher right now, what I can see is that all, none of these students have turned their work in. If I tap on student one, there's their work. I can access it, but they haven't turned it in. Student three, same thing, and student four, same thing. So right now I do have access to their work right through Google Classroom or through Google Drive but they haven't actually turned it into me. Now this is critical because when the student has not turned the work in yet, the student can edit the document, the teacher can insert suggested edits or comments. So it actually looks like one student, student three, already turned their work in and you can see C submission history, which means that student has turned it into me. Now this is the kind of the next step of classroom. When a student decides to turn the work in, now the editing status goes to the teacher, um, but the student gets commenting status. So what you can also do, if you don't want this view to look at student work, you have two ways to get to the other side of this. I can click right on folder from classroom and it will bring me to the Google Drive folder to find the work so I don't have to dig or look for anything. Or I can manually go to Google Drive, go into my classroom folder, go into the folder for that particular class, go into the folder for that particular assignment, and then I can see all the assignments that were turned in, my student two, student three, and student four. Hey, Greg. Yes. Hey, before you go any further, can you answer a couple of questions from the chat? That's Absolutely. All about you, let, let them, let, you, if you could dictate them to me, and then I'll do the answering. Yeah, so the first um, question that came up was about email notifications, where like every time that someone turns something in, potentially a teacher gets an email, and if there's a way to turn off or to modify those, on, those notifications, so like, that's the first big one that came in. Are you, are you talking about when you get email notifications through Google Classroom? Yeah, so there was a comment from Nick that um, one issue that teachers were having is that um, every time that you get an email for every activity that happens in classroom, and so he was wondering if there was a way to, to turn off that notification. So, geez, that's a really good question. Um, I, I guess I would say that the only notifications that I'm seeing coming through are comments that are made. Um, I'll go back to that Gmail account. For example, here, this, this comment came through on the student assignment, and you can turn off comments individually per document, um, but I haven't seen any documentation yet about how you can turn off, like, overall big picture notifications going from classroom to your Gmail account in that same Google account. I can do some side research while we're working through this and see if we can find an answer to that, but I haven't had anyone um, suggest a solution yet. Okay, and then the next question was about ownership, that apparently there was an issue before where ownership would flip back and forth. Meaning when the student turns it in, the ownership flips? Uh, I think so, and maybe Maureen can, can clarify in the chat box right now. I'm just reading her question about, you know, have they changed the ownership thing yet? Where the, does the ownership flip back and forth like it did at first? Yeah, like if, well, if you go right now, like all the students have turned the work in, so you can see that the owner is me, meaning the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, what we can do now really quickly, I'll go into the assignment. I'll return these all back to the students, and I'll talk more about what that means momentarily. I'm going to okay. go back to Google Drive and refresh, and we'll see if this actually pushes the refresh through, and we see. Yeah, so now if you notice, when the teacher turns the work back to the student, the ownership switches immediately back to the student. If the students, meaning myself, Beth, and Sean, if you guys could all resubmit, 
So I'm okay. resubmitting the assignment right now. What we should see, whether I might have to refresh, this might not happen live. You can see student four, which is me as the student, I just turned it back to my teacher and the ownership changed. The reason why that's happening is because it's that's the way that the Google Classroom is changing the status, whether you can edit the document or your view only. So yes, the ownership flip-flops back and forth when students turn in work or when the teacher turns it back to the student. Okay, and actually while while you were saying that, we had um, Mia in the chat was able to actually answer the email notifications point. Oh, great. So if you go back to the home screen of your class, mm -hmm. there's the three little lines in the top left. And if you click on those, there's a settings button at the very bottom underneath all of where your classes are listed out. And then you can uncheck the box that says send email notifications. Thank you, Mia. That was fantastic. Yeah, Mia, thank you very much for that. So we're going to pick up from there. Um, Outstanding, and thank you very much for bailing us out, Mia. I'm going to go into this assignment now. Now, one thing we did really quickly was the students submitted the assignment. It was collected all in that one Google Drive folder. I'm going to get back to that folder. So there's the US History 1 assignment. All the work was collected. So when the students submitted it, it changed the ownership over to the teacher. The teacher can now go in and edit that document. I actually, at one point, I checked off all of the work and I returned it to the students. What this would allow me to do is give it back to the students, let them work on the assignment, and then when they're done, they can turn it back to me. And this can happen on a whole class, or I could do like an individual basis, send work back to students with a note to have them work on it. Um, what I can also do is have a threaded discussion. Please. So I can have a threaded discussion right below the assignment to the individual student as well as putting comments into the document or editing the document itself. So there's lots of ways to um, have that communication back and forth about student assignments. Um, one thing to keep in mind with Classroom is the only way that you're going to be able to immediately see the work that you're pushing out to the students is if it is a teacher-generated document that you are making the copy for the students. So what we're going to do next is actually have the students make a document on the fly on their own and turn it in without any teacher generated work. And you'll see kind of the difference of what's going to happen here. So I'm back in classroom. I'll go going into assignment 002 US History 1 and I'll just say please make your own Google document and turn it in. Answer our typical weekly reflection prompt. I'm just going to assign this out to the class right now. Do tomorrow. Um, all I told the students was to do is to make their own Google document. So what the students can do now, and I'm going to again swap over to that student view so you can see what the students are going to experience. And th again, this is from my iPad, but it doesn't really matter. It's, it's device agnostic. So on my iPad, I'm going into US history. And what the teacher has said, let me back up so we can see the assignment, it's saying, please make your own Google document and turn it in. So I'm going, okay, I need to do this on my own. I'll tap on the assignment, and instead of a document there waiting for me to turn in, I need to create a document on my own. So I'm going to do create document. It's making that document for me right now. But notice what it also did. Because it's a Google product, it named it for me according to the name of the assignment. So this is kind of one point to keep in mind. If students are ever using Google products, Google spreadsheets, Google slides, Google documents, it will do the naming convention for them. If they turn any other sort of file in that's not a Google product, a PDF document, a video, a screencast, a picture, it will not name the file for them. They'll have to name it themselves following some sort of naming convention. So now that I, now, now that I created the document, again, this is like it's floating in the student's backpack in Google Drive. It's not actually turned in. So we need to tap on the document to do some work with it. On an iPad, it bumps you right to the Google document. On any other environment, um, computer environment, it would bring you right to the document as well through an additional tab. And I'll say, here's my work. There, I'm done with that. I'm going to jump back to Google Classroom and just tap Turn In and turn that work into the teacher. We jump back to the teacher view right now.
So you can see that we have two that were done and one that is not done. I'm going to go into that assignment, go into the folder where it lives. And this, so this is what I was mentioning earlier. If it's a student-generated document, the teacher will not be able to see that work until it is manually turned in by the, by the student. If it's a teacher-generated document, the teacher gets a view of it the whole time. So if you're looking to have that live collaboration, make sure that it's a teacher-generated file where you're making a duplicate copy for each student. If you're telling the students, hey, just turn this in by Friday, I'm not going to take a look at it early, I'm not going to help you or do any sort of collaboration, then you can go with the student-generated side um, in Google Classroom. And you can see here as well, it looks like one of our students actually turned in a picture. Let's see if we can open that picture. Hopefully it's safe viewing. There we go. So there's a picture that was turned in. So anything that can get into Google Drive, whether it's a Google Drive product or, a pro or any kind of third-party product you can get into Google Drive, you can turn that assignment in. So before we go any further, Beth, are there any other new kind of outstanding questions or yeah. can we keep plowing ahead? Yeah, there's one more. So, and this was a great one from Megan about does the revision history save? So, as this goes back and forth, if the teacher was collaborating, um, does the whole revision history save within the document? Let's go into the document and find out. Okay. Wow, someone actually wrote an assignment here. So, here's our assignment created by one of our students. I'm going to go file, see revision history. So, we can see student one jumped in there at 824, nothing was done. By 825, they added that green content in there. What I will do now as a teacher, um, so I added that in. We'll go file, see revision history. And there you can see student, student in green, teacher in pink, revision history is preserved. Any other discussion questions we should address? Uh, that's it for right now. Thanks. Okay, no problem. So um, what we're going to do now is take a look at um, kind of some non-Google stuff. So like I mentioned earlier, um, depending on what sort of resource or tool you're working with, um, if you're working with any sort of tablet device, whether it's an iPad or a Nexus tablet or anything like that, students may be doing some work with PDFs where they're annotating PDF documents. Or you might have them creating some sort of video product and they might be actually uploading the video directly to Google Drive or maybe sending the video to YouTube and turning a link in through Google Classroom. So that's the uh, approach we're going to take now. So. Um, Sean and Beth, let me jump and share my iPad screen. Um, are you guys on iPads or computers right now as you're role playing the student? I'm on a computer right now. Sean, what are you on right now? Computer. Okay, computer. Um, all right, I'm going to role play this myself. I'll do the iPad side of this really quickly, um, and then I'll have you guys jump in as well in a second. So I'm going to do 003. history and I'll say please turn in your annotated copy of the Gettysburg Address. So I'm telling the students you need to go get a copy of the Gettysburg Address, do your work on top of it and turn that in to me. And I'm not going to give them the resource while I could, I won't do that right now, I'm just going to assign this out to the students. So Sean and Beth you don't have to worry about this because you're not working from iPads. Um, let me jump again really quick so you can see the process I'll go through to do this kind of non-Google product turn in. So on my iPad right now, there is my copy of the Gettysburg Address that I found online and like I said the teacher could have pushed this out through Google Classroom. I knew there's a copy on the web so I just grabbed it. So I'm going to do open in bump this Gettysburg address over to Notability because that's where I'd like to do my work on top of it. And there's my Gettysburg address. Now what I mentioned earlier is when you're using anything that's non-Google, you have to do the manual naming conventions. So whether you're using uh, making video or annotating PDFs or whatever it is that you're doing, making a screencast, you have to do the manual naming convention. So I'm going to do 003.
So I name that file. Now I'm going to go through and pretend like I'm a student and do all of my inking on top of this. And I'll do some highlighting. If I were really doing work here, I would, I would answer a question. There, so there's my final work as if I was annotating this document. So what I'm going to do now is bump this out of Notability. I'll do Open In, and then I'm just going to shoot this over to Google Drive. Wait for this document to upload, and then you can see in my Google Drive account, I notice like in big Google Drive, not in a folder. You don't. The students don't have to put it in the classroom folder. They can just leave it in Google Drive. They can put it in their classroom folder if they want to. I left it there. So what I need to do now is go back over to Google Classroom. I'm going to find assignment three where my teacher told me to annotate on top of that PDF document. And instead of creating something, because I'm not creating that document, I'm going to add that file from my Google Drive account. And notice this is where you get the options under add to add a link. Or if you're on a computer, you can upload a file from your desktop, whether that's um, an image file, a video file, whatever it is, you can grab that file. I'm going to dig into my Google Drive account. There's that PDF document that I just created. I'm going to add that to the assignment. It's processing it right now, and there's 003 US History Coolwick.pdf. Now, again, I haven't turned this in yet because I haven't clicked that Turn In button, and Google Classroom is indicating that by Not Done and Due Tomorrow in bright red. So I'm going to tap Turn In, turn this file in, and now the assignment's been turned in. So let me, again, jump back over to the teacher view. So here I'm back on the teacher view. I'll go into that assignment. And I can see that there's one student that completed it, and there's another student that completed it. And this is, again, what will happen if students don't name this correctly. So I have one uh, terrible student who's not listening to directions. I'm not sure which of my two students that is. And here's my other student who did the naming convention. I'm going to jump right into the Google Drive folder because I want you to see what it's going to look like there as well. So here's the Google Drive folder, and we have named, named, and misnamed. And I can go into the one that I just turned in so you can see what this is going to look like when a, student, a teacher were to view this. And here's that annotated PDF mm -hmm. with the student's answer and all of their kind of close reading and highlighting along the way. Hey, wait. But before you talk about my misnaming, that was on purpose for a second. I'll take it. Okay. So one thing I did just discover, and I'm not sure if anyone had tested this out. So I had an annotated PDF of the Gettysburg Address, but in a different Google Drive account. I shared it with this demo account so that I could try and add it, even though I had added it to my drive because I was not the owner of the original document. It wouldn't let me submit it as an assignment. So I had to make a copy of it before I could actually turn it in. So that's one thing to keep in mind if you're, you know, yes, I could still make a copy technically of somebody else's or my alter ego's work and then turn it in, but there is that little bit of a buffer that I could not just turn in a shared document. Excellent. So one thing that we haven't talked at all about is um, grading student work within Classroom, and I just want to address that relatively quickly, and then we'll move on to the video component um, and then any other kind of additional um, thoughts about Classroom. So within Google Classroom, you have the ability, and I'm actually jumping back to assignment one, you have the ability to grade student work directly here. So for example, I have three students. They all have resubmitted their work, and you, you notice it says no grade, no grade, no grade. Now by default in Classroom, you have this four-point grading scale, or you can mark this as ungraded. One thing that you can do if you don't use only 1, 20, 50, and 100, you can say, I'm just going to make this actually a 10-point assignment and hit return. Classroom will say, you know, you're about to update the point value. Do you really want to do this? I'll say, yes, update. So now I can go in here, tap on student one, open up their Google document, read their work, give them comments, and then drop a grade on here. So I'm going to give this student a grade of 10. Go on to the next student, a grade of 10. Next student, a grade of 10. Now, if you'll notice, it says not return, not return, not return. My students cannot see the grades until I manually return that assignment to them. So once I tap 
return. It says, you know, you're about to turn the, return the assignment. The students will go back into editing mode. Do you want to leave any feedback, kind of big picture feedback for everyone? Um, I'm going to skip that and just tap return assignment. So I'm going to jump back to student mode. Give me one second here so you can see what that's going to look like for the student. So we should see my iPad right now. And you can see I went into assignment one. There's the document that I could open up if I wanted to. And here's the document that bumped me right to it. I'll go back to classroom. You can see in the top right-hand corner, that's where I can see my grade. So whether you want to use the internal grading platform in Classroom or you want to drop the grades right in the documents or you're not going to do any sort of grading in Classroom, just recognize that it's there as an option. Um, I know I've been working with teachers who don't like the grading setup in Google Classroom and they stick just you know, with their own gradebook and the students can log into the online gradebook. Some teachers think this is fantastic. One thing that I think we should be aware of here, and let me swap back over to my teacher view so you can see this. is that in classroom, um, the, the way the students will be named will be alphabetically by their first name. So that can cause some trouble if you're dealing with pushing grades over to a grade book. This is based on like a last name naming convention. Now you have an option here in classroom to download these grades. And what it actually does is download a CSV file for you. So you might have a grading platform that accepts a CSV upload or once it's a CSV file you could go through and kind of reorganize the CSV file alphabetically by last name, which would let you more easily, you know, drag and drop or just duplicate those grades over to whatever grade book you are using. So keep that in mind in terms of internal grading. Students do not see the grades until you grade it and return the work back to them. So again, um, Beth, are there any questions that popped up in the chat box that we should address before we do this kind of uh, video um, concept and then do kind of big picture takeaways and some helpful tips? Yeah, so there's two that popped up. The first one from Kara is like once you grade an assignment, does it disappear from the home page or like does it scroll down like a blog? Oh, so let's go in here. I'll go back to my classroom. Hold on one second. So if, you know, if you'll notice here, Classroom looks like a stream in a way, like it just, the old stuff gets pushed to the bottom like a blog. So U.S. History 1 has been graded and, you know, Assignment 1 has been graded and returned. Three students are done with it. It's there on the bottom of Classroom. As I scroll up, there's Assignment 2. If I scroll up, there's Assignment 3. Also on the left, you always get this update of, like, upcoming assignments that are due. Once the assignments reach their due date and it's passed, these will drop off from this notification, but they will always stay here in Google Classroom as this kind of ongoing threaded stream. Great. And then the, hang on, wait, sorry, now there's so many questions. Hold on a sec. So then the next question was, is there a parent component, like if parents wanted to see the grades? No, so there's no parent component in the, I think the biggest uh, fact, because this is domain specific, so if I, even if I had the class code, and I don't even think I talked about that to begin with, and I apologize, every time you set up a classroom, and let me jump over and share my screen one more time so you can see what I mean. Hold on one second. So every time you set up a new class in Google Classroom, like here's my classroom, you know, for this webinar, here's another class. If I go into this class, there's a class code right here. Um, you can... Uh, reset the class code or disable the class code. But even like we're projecting this live on the webinar right now, no one in the webinar can join this room because they're not in the domain that we're using. So there's no way to get parents into the domain. Um, I don't know of any schools that make parent accounts in their Google Apps for Education domain, so there's no way for students and teachers to get into the classroom. However, I was talking to a, a parent recently in a workshop. She's a classroom teacher but has her... Um, her, I think it was her daughter is in a school where they're using Google Classroom. And she said from the parent perspective, she loves it because her daughter will log into Classroom and show her, her, her mom her classroom kind of interface. And her mom can quickly see every single class she's in, what assignments are coming up, what's due, what's been graded. So while there's no individual parent login, it's nice for a parent um, if the school is kind of taking this unified approach of using Classroom because they can sit down with their son or daughter, have them log in and see everything right in that one really clear view and jump from class to class really easily. Any other questions? You said there were a number that were rolling down there. What else do we have? 
Um, so there was that one. I think I actually answered the others. One was, again, about adding grades to different gradebook programs, but you mentioned it was the CSV file that, exactly. like, if you can import it, I think that's probably more on the gradebook's end. Yeah, and I think, honestly, the easiest thing to do would be download the CSV file, um, reorganize the spreadsheet by last name, and then just do a split screen. CSV file on one side, your gradebook on another window, and then just copy and paste grades over. Yeah. Um, and then the last question, and I, I may have answered it, but I'm not positive for Mia, but if there's a time where sometimes you can comment in a student's document and then return it, and other times you can't, is there anything that might be causing that? Yeah, I mean, when this first came out, I saw glitches where even when students turned it in, the student could still edit, or when the teacher submitted it back to the student, the teacher could still edit. It should not be the case. Um, whoever's currently holding the document should be the editor, and then the other party is the commenter. But I've seen it be act glitchy. I've seen issues where documents won't open up at all, or if a teacher pushes out a PDF file, it actually won't even open up for the student. So anything's possible. Um, but that shouldn't technically be happening. OK, thanks. All right, we ready to keep rolling? Uh, yeah, keep going. OK, so um, a few more things that I wanted to demo, and then we're going to go to kind of big picture stuff. One thing that I like about this, and hopefully we can get this to work, I'll do 004 US History. This is the ability to attach multiple files to an assignment. So what I'm going to do is jump over. I'm going to jump over to YouTube really quickly. Oops, I don't need that. I don't need any of this. Sorry about that, guys. So the teacher, I might say, okay, my students need this crash course video on World War One. I. I'm going to grab this URL, go back to classroom, and give them that link. I'll add that in. And then I might also say they need... Um, I also want them to read this eyewitness to history about the assassination in 1914, and I'm going to add this in also as a link. And then I could also build my Google document, which I'm going to do right now. So there's my document, please discuss World War I. So I'll go back to classroom and I'm going to dig into Google Drive now, grab assignment four, add that in, and I'll make that make a copy for each student. So in this case, within one assignment, I pushed out a YouTube video, I pushed out a link to a website where I want them to read, and I've actually pushed out the assignment. Now what I might do in the comments here, I might write like, watch the video, read the article, complete the doc push it out to one class and hit assign. Now when this assignment gets, pu assignment gets pushed out, the students will have access to all three resources, the video, the link, and the document to complete. So in that sense, and you can, so you can push out multiple resources at once. Um, another way that you could do this, if you wanted to do some sort of differentiation or give students different project choices, I might push out a document, um, an assignment to do a video, I might push out a set of slides that they can kind of manipulate and work from. So you, in a way, you can differentiate or give students different options in terms of what is it that they actually want to turn in. So there's one thing I definitely wanted to demo is multiple files for one assignment. Another thing is the ability to turn in video. So I'm just going to call this 005 US History Video Assignment. So what you can do, if students are working from a computer and they have video that they've uploaded to YouTube, they can turn in the link to that YouTube video. If students are working from a mobile device and they have video that they've created, so I'm shooting video of our webinar right now with my iPad. I'm just going to shoot a quick five-second video. Great, so that video is done. Um, if students have video on their mobile device, if they can get the video into Google Drive, they can turn that video in. So I'm going to do a, another quick screen share so you can see that process. I'm going to work through that process on an iPad. 
Sean and Beth, if you have video of any sort on your computer, feel free to try to get it up to Google Drive and turn it in. If you don't, feel free to turn in a link to a YouTube video that maybe you've uploaded, or you can plagiarize and steal someone else's work and turn that in as well right now. So I'm going to go to my student iPad, open the Google Drive app. I'm going to upload that video that I just shot. I shot like a five-second video of our webinar and upload that content. So it's uploading. We're getting the notification on the bottom of the screen. Hopefully it doesn't take too long to upload. We're almost done. Now, like I mentioned earlier, anything that's a non-Google product, it needs to be renamed by the student if you want it to get um, you know, turned in with any specific naming convention. I'm not going to rename this. I'm just going to leave it as is. And now that that's uploaded, I have img0062.mov. That's in my Google Drive account on my mobile device. I'm going to jump back over to Google Classroom right now. There's assignment five, the video assignment. And instead of creating something, which I don't want to do, I'm going to add something that is in my Google Drive account. It's going to dig in. And I know I want to turn in that video. I'm going to hit add. Once it processes and drops onto the screen like it did right there, now I'm going to turn this into my teacher. So I've just turned in my video to my teacher. So let me jump back to my teacher view. So I have one student that turned it in. It looks like Beth and Sean have the, oh, someone turned it in. So we have one student who has the inability to turn in the video right now. I'm going to jump into assignment five. Student two is not done. We're not going to pick on who that is. There's a video file right there, and there is another video file. Now, the, the beauty of having students turn in video, especially for mobile devices, they could create an iMovie, send it to the camera roll, upload it to Google Drive. They can create and explain everything, send that video right to Google Drive. So any app that it can either send right to Google Drive or any app, video creation app they can send to the camera roll, the students can get it to Google Drive and turn that in from a mobile device. If they're working from a computer, um, as long as they can get their video up to their, say, YouTube account or Vimeo account, they can turn the link into their video. I'm going to jump right to the Google Drive folder right now for this particular assignment. And hopefully these loaded quickly, um, quick enough. I don't even have to download these. I can tap on movie. It's not yet processed. So this is typical. This could take a few seconds for this to process. I'll try this one. Not yet processed. So if I went through maybe three, four minutes, these videos would process, and I could watch them here. There is one. It just processed. So I can watch this video directly through Google Drive without having to download that, and that assignment was turned in by the student um, from their mobile device or through a link directly to Google Classroom. So before we jump to kind of that last, I have a couple overview slides of things to consider. One thing that I did not mention yet is you have a few other tabs across the top. My students tab, I actually have the, the ability to directly email students right from Google Classroom, and that would be dependent upon um, your Google Apps for Education domain having Gmail open for your students. You can also remove students from this um, students page as well. If you have students that have changed your class or dropped the class, you can bump them out of your classroom. One helpful thing to recognize, it's a little bit buried on here, under your About tab, you can kind of give your, your um, Google Classroom some overview, but the nice thing on the bottom here of the About tab is where it says Add Materials. This is where you can add those like universally used resources that you use over and over and over again. So you might add a graphic organizer as a PDF document, or you might add a few Google Doc templates, or you might add um, a link to a website that you're going to use over and over and over again. And if the students now access this About tab in their student view of the Google Classroom, they can get to any additional resource that you may have posted for them. So that's almost like having that, that static resources page, and you do have an access to that view in Google Classroom. So again, Beth, if we have, are there, if there's any questions, and if there are not, then I'll jump to that last. Um, there's a tip slide and then something to consider as well. So what do you have for us? No, I was going to say, I keep going. I think... Um... I think we're good. I there seems well, no, I take it back. So the first question had been if a student creates a video and they upload it to Drive and then they turn it in, that file size, like however many gigs, those are sitting in the students 
Google Drive. So like, even if they turn it in, it doesn't then transfer to the teacher account, correct? Well, it, uh, that's a really good question. I mean, the Google Documents technically change ownership, but because it's not a Google document, I don't think it's technically changing ownership from student to teacher. Um, I don't think I'd have students uploading anything beyond a minute-long video anyway. We're talking like really short, maybe a math screencast or explain a concept. If it's anything of any substantial length, I would say bump it to YouTube or Vimeo and turn the link in instead. However, um, turning links in on an iPad is, I think, almost impossible. I have not been able to do it yet, so just recognize that limitation as well. All right, thanks. Is that it? I think that's it. All right, perfect. So let's jump to our slides. We'll get my slides pulled back up. See if I can find my slides at this point. There they are. All right, so um, we, we talked about, we did kind of a demo of all this iPad and Google Classroom stuff, Google Docs created by teachers, by students, annotated PDFs, uploading video. It's all possible. Um, one thing that I did want to point out is workflow from an iPad and Google Classroom. If students upload any sort of file into a folder in their Google Drive account, this screenshot here um, is showing that you can't actually click on folders and open them up when you're trying to submit that work through Google Drive. So if students put work in any sort of folder, they actually have to search for the name of the file to then select it and turn it in. Or they can just upload it to their kind of big Google Drive select it from this view and turn it in. Um, so just be aware of that. You can't tap on folders in Google Classroom on an iPad to dig in and find work. You have to search for it by name, like I demoed here, then select it, and then turn it in. So it's one of those little tedious workflow things to be aware of. So helpful tips to consider. Naming uh, conventions, we talked about that. Using like a number convention or an alphabet, uh, you know, you can alphabetize them, but think about some sort of naming convention. Again, these are some other um, ideas that I've come across by reading various blog posts, experimenting myself. Um, a thoughtful way that you could use Google Slides is make one Google Slide deck, um, push it out for the entire class to edit, and then assign individual students to work on individual slides or assign a handful of slides per student. So you can have whole class Google Slide creation by giving the whole class the editing capability. Google Spreadsheets can take on a whole new life as well. You can do entire class data entry if you're pushing out one spreadsheet to the whole class. Or, again, I give a tip of the hat to Alice Keeler for this idea. She talked about using Google uh, Spreadsheets as a, as a discussion platform, where you can say, column one, enter your name. Column two, write your thoughtful um, you know, reflection or comment or feedback. So instead of having chaos of all 30 students on one, one document, you can have students taking lines of a spreadsheet um, uh, to act as like a discussion platform. Like I demoed as well, you can push out multiple files at once, links, YouTube um, URLs, documents per assignment, which can be really helpful. Also, you have the ability to differentiate because you can um, push out multiple documents per assignment and let students pick the assignment they like to complete, whether it's assignment one or assignment two or video assignment or make a thing link or create a website so they can pick the assignment and decide what they'd like to turn back in. And then I demoed that class resources page where you can put all of your frequently used files that you want your students to get to without having to remind them where they are or push it out on the top of class so it doesn't have to appear on the top of that stream. It just can be sitting there in that class resources file. We have a number of additional resources here. Um, in the slides, there's two posts I put up on Edgedemic Intro to Google Classroom with an extensive video tutorial. iPads with the Google Classroom, again, really long video tutorial. Um, a couple of links to Alice's blog, five potential mistakes you can make, which we, we included in this webinar. And then she... 15 more things you can do with Google Classroom. And then Google itself has a really helpful um, page on Google Classroom. It'll answer any kind of technical questions that you may have. So at this point, the technical side of the webinar is over. Um, if, there, if any additional questions popped up, Beth, in the last few minutes, I'd be happy to answer those. And then I'll have you do slides to wrap up the evening. Nothing there for us at all? No, I think I think we've fried everybody. There's no more comments. Hopefully, at this point, we have. So, Beth, if you could just talk about the uh, yeah. extra opportunities we have to work with EdTech Teacher. 
Sure, yeah. So, uh, so everybody, we do have our iPad Summit coming up in November, and the early bird registration is open. We will be announcing this next week, but we will also have a webinar series in October that we're going to co-host with Connected, the Connected Learning Alliance. So those are actually going to kick off on Tuesday, October 7th, but the full schedule and registration will be up soon. And then also we'll put it in the chat box, but we've got tons. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Tons and tons and tons, I'll put this up, uh, of information at edtechteacher.org. So take a look around our website. We've got app recommendations, some Google Apps info, lots of things going on. So, Greg, thank you so much. You did really a tremendous job. I know I learned a ton. Um, thanks, Sean, for joining us, and we hope we'll see you all again really soon. So, Thanks, everybody. Good. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Sorry for um, <laughs> having you play the dummy student, Sean. Yeah, you know, I, I like to play the dummy student sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I'm out of here. See ya.